This man's name is David Morales. David, thank you so much, brother, for coming on. Thank you. I, I, as you know what? Uh, whenever I need somebody to introduce me, <laughs> I'm going to ask for you. <laughs> that, that was so, I didn't know whether to like grab a box of tissues or have a shot on that one. <laughs> it's the truth, though. Come on, we love you. We know that. It's, no, you know what? It's really, it's funny to have somebody talk about you. Because you know what? After doing this for so many years, it's really interesting when you hear somebody speak about you in a third person. When they throw all the names and you're know, all this and that, because, you know, as life goes on, you know what I mean, doing this for over 40 years, you know what I mean, it's like, wow, yes, you know what? Oh, my God. And then, because it's important not to, not to drink the Kool-Aid <laughs> and get lost in that thing. So, you know what I mean, you know, I love what I do. But it's it's very funny to hear when they really describe you and they big you up and they talk about the accomplishments. And you know what I mean? Because it's been like a journey and you just keep it moving. You don't have time to reflect on that because you have to, you have to be busy with what's ahead of you. But thank you for pointing all that stuff out. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've been told I'm the love child of Oprah Winfrey, Phil Donahue, and all of them put together. So this is kind of cool that, you know, I'm able to have this conversation with you like this. So let's get right into the first question as I ask everyone. The younger, I've seen the picture of you with the headphones holding the two vinyl records in the late 70s. We know that. We know you were always a DJ. But how does music find you? Where does it begin for you? You know, mom's house, where, how does it start? I want to say the first time I noticed a record, it had to be, it was Spinning Wheel by Blood, Sweat, and Tears. It was an RCA record. I actually remember it was, the label was beige with the white RCA, seven inch, of course. And I must have been, like I said, it was my babysitter's house. So I had to be, I don't know, five, four, five, five, really. I couldn't be more than five because I was able to at least understand and it's funny because my parents are puerto rican i mean and i live in obviously in brooklyn i live i grew up in williamsburg and you know it was one of those block with factories junkies social clubs i mean it was like it was you know what we call the ghetto you know what i mean and um there was a social so 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 I like music and I like American music. I mean, because in our house, you know, moms, you know, they house is stereo, and the only music was you know, Latin music. You know what I mean? So, but I wasn't into music that even when I used to go, we used to go to the pair of my family's house to dance and all that to well, last few the parties. I would always go to the bedroom, which was always the coat check. <laughs> In those parties, the bedroom was a co check. And I would just watch TV. I, I couldn't be bothered with hearing, you know, with hearing, with hearing Latin, Latin music. And, and, you know, I wasn't even into Elton John either or, or any of this. I liked the Temptations. I liked the Jackson 5. Um, you know, uh, my God, you know, the Supremes, um, you know, the OJs. Glad it's not in the pips. I like black music, for lack of a better word. There was a, underneath us, you know, one of those days, you know, where every ghetto had, you know, they had their social clubs, which was really just an illegal place with flat black paint, day glow sprays, and a jukebox. And obviously where I lived, the jukebox had, you know, Mr. Big Stuff, Honeycombs, One Ass, Young and Single and Free. You know what I mean? The Jackson, so this is where I was at. You know what I mean? So my, First record that I bought, I must have been, I was in a sixth grade. It was Neither One of Us by Gladys Knight and the Pips. My second one was the OJ's Put Your Hands Together. I remember buying that record and putting the, 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 that cheap stereo speaker out the window and playing that shit for 100 times. I think my mother wanted to break it all over my head because I played that record to death. 
You know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? I, uh, you know what I mean? I liked music. Yes, TV was one thing, but when it came to music, I liked my funk. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't care for lack. I don't want to see me. I'm not making, I didn't, I was into white white music. You know what I mean? I was into WWRL. You know what I mean? I wasn't into what was it? W A B C B B B B. Even though that's the first station you hear. What, what was the other station on um, FM W W W something? Uh, 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 anyway, so I mean, and then um, um. I used to hang out when I was going to junior high school. Um, I liked, you know, my, uh, I liked music. My aunt, my aunt, well, my cousins, they were better off than we were. And I mean, their father had a better job. They had toys, man, they had bicycles, and they had a Marant sound system. At my house, we had one of those things that it was like, it looked like furniture, the TV, and the stereo. We all know what that's like. If any of y'all come my age, you know what that was. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some things were heavy. It was on four legs, and it was something else. My cousin, their house, they had a Marantz receiver, and they had these speakers. And I was like, yo, I used to enjoy just, you know, listening and, you know, playing whatever they had, or even listening, because I, I knew their sound system was better than ours. So I grew up in Flatbush. I used to go to Walt Whitman Junior High School. On Flatbush Avenue between Church and Snyder, meanwhile, there was Erasmus Hall High School right there. There was a store, a record store called Titus Oaks there, and it was two floors. And it was one of those stores that they sold. You know, they had everything. You know what I mean? Um, and even though I had no job, I had no money to buy records, but I used to go into that record store every day when I got out of school, okay? And those were the days when I went to school. Because <laughs> I would go every day, even the days when I didn't go to school. And I would go, they said, I used to steal records, okay? Without the covers. <laughs> I had no money to buy, you know what I mean? So I used to hang out with, with friends of, with, well, uh, from my crew, say my crew, we used to hang out, you know, we just, we just hang out and, and they would say, you know, they used to call me Flacco back in them days. He used to say, Flacco, play some music for us. And I would just, I was a selector. I sat next to the stereo, you know what I mean? You know, and I would play music. So really, and this, this was way before, well, not way before. It was really right before the two turntable and the mixer thing came out. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, all right. And then. I remember like those were days like Grandmaster Flowers used to play out in the parks in Brooklyn. So, you know, I see this guy out there with two decks and a mixer. And I was like, yo, what is this? Okay. And I'm talking about 1975, 1975. Okay. Now it's like, okay, this is something else. My junior high school prom when Dr. Love was out was like the rest of the day, you know, and instead of like asking my date to dance, I was busy looking at the DJ or what he was doing. <laughs> but let me tell you the funny story. So now my first mixer was a mic mixer from the, from the blackout in 1977. And I had one of those, it was, it was hijacked from Radio Shack that was broken into. It was a mic mixer. And I jimmied that mic mixer. It had no cueing. It had quarter inch, left and right, left and right. So that was my first mixer. I didn't know anything about cueing. So imagine, you had two knobs for each that you had to do for each channel. My first, turn, my first pair of turntables, first of all, they weren't even mine. They were like, however they arrived at outdoor. <laughs> And one had pinch control, one didn't have pinch control. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So the what? first time, the first time I touched a real mixer, we went to a house party in the Bronx. And this was when the record, um, and the, one of the first mixes that came out was called the Clubman One. It was very famous back there, back in those days. So 
listen, what the, imagine the setup is in the kitchen. The speakers are in the living room. And, you know, back in those pre-war buildings, they were big apartments. You know what I'm saying? They were huge. You had no clue. DJs today don't know. It's like, we all love our monitors, but y'all don't know what it is to play without no monitors. <laughs> so, so it was my, my friend's brother's house. So he was like, you know, he had juice. He goes, yo, Dave, you, you, you're a clock or you want to play some records? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? And I used to get the guy's records. I never forget what my first record was. It was Zing went to strings of my heart by the tramps. So the guy was queuing with the headphones and I'm like, okay, let me make believe like I know what I'm doing because I never use headphones. I used to play with a little, you know, radio shack bullshit mic mixer. It wasn't made for, for DJing. And he, this guy was using, he was doing play this. I put on the headphones trying to be cool. I flipped the switch. I heard music. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> what's going on here? You know what I mean? So, you know, um, and of course, uh, you know, I even though I didn't have money to to buy equipment yet, you know what I mean. Not while I was not while I was going to school. I mean, I, I dropped out of school, and I got a job working working a restaurant. I was one of those kids that you know used to go buy rock and soul because my first turntables came from rock and soul. So you know they had the layaway plan. <laughs> But and how my long, first, how long take you to lay away those turntables to get them? And well, what I first, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I first got the SLB ones, which was the cheapest ones to buy that had pitch control, they were belt driven, the B ones. So I could, I, I could mess around with the 1700s back then or the 1800s, you know what I mean? They were, and so, um, but I was one of those kids, I used to walk by, dream. You know what I mean? You know, you know, you go to the record store. Walter Gibbons was working at Rock and Soul. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Dumpston. Keith Dumpston. Keith, Keith Dumpston, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So even though I didn't know them at that time, you know I mean, I didn't even know who Walter Gibbons was. How about that? You know what I mean? And, you know, you went there, you know. Even though you had no money to buy records, okay, buy the buy records, but you know, walk by and look at that mixer and, and look at those turntables and dream, dream. Listen, I did sweet sixteens. I I mean, the days where you carried, you took every crate of record. If you had ten crates of record, you took all ten crates to a game. Okay. Um playing weddings for fifteen dollars, and it's like having to chase people down to collect $15. I've done parties for Don, for, for, for um, what's his name? Don King for the boxing matches. Um, you know, we've all done, been down that road. I used to play for people, even though I had no equipment and I knew people that loved, that liked how I play, they bought turntables, they, they bought a system and would invite me over to the house and say, I want you to come over my house and play some music for me. And you know what I mean? You go to hang out at somebody's house and let's say the TV's on and they got their wife and they got their kids and I'm sitting there like, I can't wait for him to say, yo, you want to play some records? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? You know, it's like, you know, I, 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 I have spoken to, to some people, you know, that have asked me things and I said, you know, this thing was my life. Even back in the days, like when you watch the get down, that's my story. You know what I'm saying? I used to, I, uh, you know, I mean, I used to, you know, I used to do graffiti and music. I mean, they were both intertwined. I used to break dance. I mean, that that was really my life. I mean, doing those house parties, I did hooky parties. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean, where I make kids cut out from school is like, you know what? But I lived to play. You know what I'm saying? It's like every day was like, I was consumers. How do I, I say, my parents would go to work. I was going to Prospect Heights. I go, I buy a, I buy a, a quarter OE, a trade bag of weed. My parents went to work. I go back home in my bedroom and I'm banging it and I'm banging this shit out. I had 18 inch speakers <laughs> when I was 15 years old in, in, me, in my bedroom. And the first discotheque I went to and saw a real DJ. Right. What's that? What is this? I, 
it was Starship Discovery one and Ernie Dunder was playing. And I was it was the end of the Starship because because um, <laughs> because bad people like us were getting in the club. Right. You know That's saying? when you knew oh, it was oh, done. So the, the, no, not no, I didn't know back then. No, 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 I'm saying. But but now in retrospect, I got in, security let us into the side door. I mean, I was like, oh my God, I'm in a star shit. You know what I'm saying? And and I remember they had the DJ booth. It was the out it was the Al sound system. And they had the, the the booth was like in a bubble. I was that kid with the, with his nose up against that bubble like this. I didn't move from there. You know what I'm saying? And anyway, so as, as I went on over the years, I have to thank, you know, and, you know, I used to buy commercial records. You know what I mean? Because that's what I understood because my, my filter wasn't a club because I was too young to go to a club in reality. You know what I mean? So the only music I knew was commercial black music. You know what I mean? My, my, the only imports, imports, my first import I bought at Downstairs Records when Yvonne Turner was working there was the Stranger and Martin Circus, okay? And um, my, my brain is like funny. So I played, so there was an older crowd from my neighborhood. That was Lulu, um, this guy named Lenny, um, um, and some other people. They used to go to the loft. I had never been to the loft. They were loft members. So, um, Lulu's boyfriend at the time, Lenny was having, she was doing uh, a private, no, not a surprise birthday for him. So she asked me to play. I um, mean, um, I had played, I, have, I have played before that for Lulu at a house party when I had mismatched turntables. So Lulu, I've been down with Lulu for like a long time. Many of y'all may know Lulu, you know, Lulu, you know, she's been around the, the parties. Yeah. The glamorous, the glamorous Lulu. <laughs> glamorous Lulu. So, so you know, Lulu knew everybody back in them days. You know what I'm saying? She knew, she knew everybody. So, you know, where she did house parties, uh, the the bar was was in the kitchen with one of those half doors, charging a dollar for a drink. La la la. So, and that was when Madeline Kane was out. You know, what I mean, Rough Diamond and those records. So. She did a party um, for this guy, for, for, for her boyfriend at the time, and they bought me a bunch of these loft records, which was really a lot of imports, a handful of records that were like, you know, check out these jams. And I was like, where, where do I get this music from? Because that opened my eyes to a whole nother world of music, the loft. I knew first choice. I knew what was available. You know what I'm saying? But when it came to power line, when it came to love money, when it came to city, country, city, I was like, yo, like, chow, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, expansions, anyway, this and whatever, 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 whatever. So where do I buy this? Okay, here's where vinyl mania comes in. You know what I mean? So I was one of those kids where a copy of Crown Heights Affair, say a prayer for two, is like $75. But when I got that record, I was like, yo, I got pow, oh my God, pow. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the journey, my God. I, I, I used to, and I, I was a loft head. I used to go every day, every, every Saturday after I became a member. Me and David became friends. David had gave me some books. I even did a graffiti poster for the loft that he put up. I was so happy. I drew him, I drew him, you know, a shirt with the loft that he wore. And I was like, oh my God, you know? And, so that really, for me, was a turning point when it came to music. Right. I mean, okay. I, I mean, I mean, as far as records, you know what I mean? But see, as you, far have as... Explain, you have to explain everybody why, because that music was not accessible that easy for people. No. That's the no, thing. No, because, because there's two places where I, where, where I mainly bought records. That was Downtown Records and Rock and Soul. I mean, um, Downtown, I went to first. I think the first time I went to downtown, I was probably like 14 years old, 15 years old. Then, of course, was, then I, my second store was, but when it came to, 
how you say, um, downstairs records was a little more um, eclectic kind right. of thing. And downstairs was downstairs, you know, it was in Penn Station, it was a little, you know what I mean? So, um, I, so when, 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 um, and when I lived in Flatbush, I had played, I mean, I have done, you know, I had done some house parties, you know, you know, back in the day. Um, I started to do parties at a club called the Ozone Layer. And the way I started was I had played for some girl's birthday. And in reality, it was like the only people that really came were my friends from the neighborhood. A lot of our friends from the neighborhood, they either would go to the garage or go to the law. Most of them used to go, used to go to the law. So I started doing parties that started like maybe once a month. Um, I had Lulu as I had Lulu as a as a hostess. I had um, um, Master Rick. Um, uh, 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 he was also, you know, and I had some other people, you know, that were also. We, we I call them hosts, but they were. I guess you would call them promoters today. Sure. You know I mean? but, but but they were hosts. You know what I mean? But it's okay. So everybody bought bought people, but the one thing I realized there was a common denominator with with a hardcore of of, of people that were coming from my music. You understand? So then I took from let's say once in a while to once a month, and then I started doing every Friday. And um, I still had, I still had my original job. I used to. I used to design the flyers um, on my coffee break. I used to, back to them days, we used to do a mailing list. I used to put them in the envelopes. I used to lick the envelopes. <laughs> I used to blah, 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 blah. I used to put the flyers, go to the train stations, the bus stops, you know, the phone booths back in the day. So trust me, I did my hustle, you understand? So um, I would do the parties on Friday and then go to law on Saturdays. And then, you know I mean? There was a time that I took a break from the Ozone and a couple of times on a Friday, I went to the garage. I went there and I went there Friday, of course, Friday was straight night. And I'm talking about when I was 19, 20 years old. Uh, when I was, and I only played in Brooklyn. I mean, I used to work at the record pool uh, um, for the record and I had access to acts. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, I was bringing in, you know, my God, Colonel Abrams, Anthony Malloy, J.M. Silk, Carl Bean. Um, nobody was doing that in Brooklyn. So, I mean, I ended up quitting my job because I was making some good money, like real wait, good money. Wait a minute. A lot of people weren't even doing that in Manhattan, no less in Brooklyn, bringing acts. Right. That's the difference back then. And then in 1981, I'm nine, that's a 1983. I'll never forget. Um, I was in my house with Kenny Cop with Kenny Cop with Kenny Cop because Kenny was my next door neighbor. <laughs> and I remember, my God, let me before I go over there, let me tell you about. It. So when I first met Kenny, first of all, I, I say his mixes on what was that 92 point? What, what was that station? No, yeah. 9.7? Oh no, B -L Paco was on. No, oh, Paco was on. Disco 92. Uh, no. Yeah. I thought Kenny was a white boy. <laughs> Why were you mistaken? <laughs> I was mistaken. When I say my next door neighbor, I swear to God, my next door neighbor, yeah. literally. So anyway, we met. I went, we, I went and hung out with him at Bond International. I never forget that day. It was the first and only, and it was like so massive. We had to take an escalator. I never saw a DJ use a hand truck to take his records from outside to the DJ booth. Kenny had a hand truck because that thing was like, anyway, so we ended up becoming, um, you know, you know, great friends. So one time we were hanging out and we were in my apartment and, and Mike Brody calls me and says, Hi, my name is Mike Brody. And everybody knew who Mike Brody was. You know I mean, you, you know David Mancuso owned the law. And in the garage, you knew it was Larry LeVan. And you know who Mike Brody, even if you didn't know who Mike Brody was, you knew Mike Brody owned the garage. So he says, hi, my name is Mike Brody. I want to come to Mike Paris garage. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. You know, 
um, we would like you to come play, you know, I want you to come and play in my club. I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm like, yo, Kenny. So it only after after a minute that it kicked in, it was like, oh shit. You know what I mean? It's Mike Brody. Mind you, I've never played him in hand. You understand what I'm saying? Never. And he's asking me, you know, I, he never heard me. He was like, I want you to come and play in my club. And I'm like, oh shit, wait a minute now. And it was really because, and it, between Judy Weinstein and David DePino, I have to thank them because that's how I got to Paradise Club. And how did now, that happen? Well, that's so wait, that happen. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I, I was still playing at the Ozone in Brooklyn. Right? By then, I had Kenny playing with me because Bonds had closed, which I got to give Kenny a, lot, Kenny a lot of credit because he went from Bonds International that on any given night, he was doing 5,000 people a night. Now, I go Bonds closed, I bring him into the really... It's not even the the bathroom is probably bigger than the ozone layer. The bathroom of Bonds International. So, um, you know, uh, I took Kenny on to to play with me, and we had some amazing nights, some amazing years there. Oh my God! It's like so that how so that's how I it, it allowed me to go play at the garage. So when Mike Brody approached me, and I was like. Okay, obviously it came from Judy Weinstein and David DePino. Main, I have to say mainly Judy. Because he never heard me, didn't ask me for a tape, nothing. It was based on recommendation. Now, mind you, now that maybe Judy and Bobby Shaw and other people, maybe they came out to the Ozo maybe twice in the whole time because, hey, it was Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn. And how rough was it back <laughs> you know then? I mean, tell it, it was rough. rough. It, it, I tell you, uh, I decided. It was rough enough. My security was strapped. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was a rough time. Um, you know what I mean? So, yep. Anyway, so he says, you know, um, I would like you to play. And, you know, I have Friday and Saturday. I'm like, well, I don't know if I can play a Saturday because I never played for a gay crowd. He was like, look, I just want you to come and play music. I said, okay, great. So, um, who would you like to perform? I got Captain Rap. And Jocelyn Brown, I never forget. And I played, I swear, I remember October 13, 14, 1983, Friday and a Saturday. I played each night 11 hours, a total of 22 hours. First of all, I had never played on Thorns 125 Mark twos. I was like, can you put in some techniques? <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. So how did you deal with that? Now being thrown in the booth of, of Larry's booth and now dealing with Thorne's turntables and never playing, what'd you do? When I mixed my first record, I remember I first started off, I think it was Encore, Shrevel In, and I forgot the second record was a record on the Easy Street, but I don't remember the name. But when I did that first mix on those turntables, I was like, wow. I was like, wow. Because... Even though I was supposed to go with a sound system with Larry, but that was like an impossible task. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but you know what I mean? Listen, I was a, I was a, I was a sheepskin kid that wore Adidas. I, you know what I mean? I was a knucklehead from Brooklyn that liked music. You know what I'm saying? I, I roll up there, you know, a knucklehead from Brooklyn. I don't know nothing about all this other stuff. You know what I mean? I used to take LSD, you know, and I was one of those dancers that go to the law from beginning to the end. I mean, and the same, same, you know, when I went to the garage. So, you know, you know, you go, and I remember meeting, meeting Joey Llanos. I mean, that's how long we've been friends. Jesus Christ, in 1983. Um, and it was just so, the experience was so, they put my name on the marquee and people were like, yo, how do you pull that off? Yeah. Because you want to know, because Lenny, in reality, there were so many other people that deserved to play there way before me you know what i mean from kenny carpenter to tony humphreys to uh to bruce forrest I oh mean, yeah list is a huge list in new york you know what i mean you yeah. know what i mean you know i mean there was a lot of you know great djs you know what i'm saying but obviously there was a lot of politics involved but i was immune to the politics because i i didn't understand shit <laughs> now in retrospect now i understand what it means to shade Right. Trust me, the worst I, was, I, I was like Teflon Don because I didn't know anybody. 
And I guess that's the reason why they asked me was because I didn't know anyone. You understand? And everybody else that was part of the scene, everybody knew knew everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody in the business. I didn't know nobody. You know what I mean? It was my my first club that I played at in out of Ozone Layer. It was the Paradise Garage, the greatest club in the world, the baddest sound system ever. You know what I'm saying? It was like, and, you know, I walked into the whole myth of this place because I never seen a DJ booth. You hear, I used to go there and like trip and just like be against the wall in La La Land and looking at the booth and you just heard, wow, he's got four jacks, he's got this, the blah, 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 blah. But I got to tell you, so one thing, um, to this day, to right. this day, hey, I've never, I've never seen a DJ booth like the Paradise I, Garage. I said the same. I've been saying that my whole life, and I never see it again. I've never seen a booth like that ever in my life. To this day, that was like rock star shit. You know what I'm saying? And we're talking about. I mean, I went to play there in '83, so you know, not that it was built in '83. I think it was like that from the end of the Sunday. It's like, yo, man, that thing was like, ciao, man, where are you going? That thing was like, oh. Anyway, so, and, you know, I have to say being, of course, Kenny got me into, for the record, Judy Weinstein's record pool. And being part of that record pool, really, it was really, it was the who's who of, any, of anybody was in that organization of DJs. From remixers to producers, we talking about Steve Thompson. We talking about Bruce Forrest, Chef Pettibone, Jellybean Benitez, T. Scott, um, Larry Levan, Francois Kavorkin. Yo, you understand what I'm saying? You don't get better These than that. So the guy who doesn't get any better than that. So I used to have Steve Thompson alone, which he ended up doing Metallica, Guns N' Roses. You know Steve Thompson. And Steve Thompson was a DJ out of Long Island. Steve used to come every week, pick up his records, check out the new Madonna did, check out the new Rolling Stones, the new this, the new that, yo, the new Aretha Franklin. You know what I mean? It's like, and I used to peep his brain, oh my God. Bruce Forrest was, which for me is one of the baddest technical DJs I've ever heard in my life throw down on two turntables, besides when he's, you know, you know, you know, scratch champions. But we talk about mixing pound for pound, all this kind of stuff. Bruce was a maniac. I mean, he had two copies of every record, and he just like, you just stood there and just like, yo. 1985, that I remember, we had, he bring a, a TR-505 drum machine to the DJ booth. Uh, first started with a CZ-101 keyboard before we got to, before he went on to the DX-100. He had a home, he had two uh, Korg samplers, the 1,000, the 1,000 and the 2,000. He had a box cutter that was, he, he did some MacGyver shit with the <laughs> box cutter. Wait, the guitar pedal, the guitar pedal, or sustain pedal, right. took the sample. I swear, I when I say a box cutter, you know, with a box cutter back to the, the supermarket, yeah. with a spring, and that's how I used to check it. Bop, 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 Three decks, reel to reel, two samplers, keyboard, drum machine. Here comes David Cole. We're talking about 1985. Bruce Forrest, for me, was is one of well, is my mentor when it comes to the studio. You know what I'm saying? Um, he first got me off on editing, you know, some of his his projects. And then which I started editing some things for some people. And of course, and I ended up getting a chance to do a mix on a record. Jelly Bean gave me a shot in 1987 to mix Winnie Houston Love Will Save the Day. Um, uh, you know, um, so anyway, I, I got Ray Smith from AM Records back in them days, gave me my first, he gave me my first mix, I think in 86. It was Tremaine Hawkins' Child of the King. And the first time I went to, what was that? It was a major studio on uh, right where Sam Ash is. What's that studio over there? I forgot what it was. Not, not. Anyway. Man. Yeah. No, there was a studio right there. One of those very expensive studios. Um, what? Not quite. Um, no, no, no. Quad was around the corner. Unique. No, Unique was down a the block. There was one of those really expensive ones. Um, I remember. Right track. Right track. Oh, right, track. right track. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think it was right track. 
Um, anyway, so I think uh, I I was working and then 1987, I was working at a club called Limelight, Nine Limelight, Love Light, and Joe Heck that was doing promotions for RCA. I was working, I was working for Judy at the record pool. I was a pool director. Right. Remember that. And I, I'm a big fan of imagination. So this was when Rick Ashley was out and Stock Aikman and, and Waterman were really big, you know, big English producers, remixes um, at the time. So in the record pool, we got this imagination record that Arthur, that Arthur Baker produced and it had a Stock Aikman and Water uh, mix. And I was like, nah, it's like, this is whack. It's like, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds like a Rick Ashley record. So I stuck my nose in and told, and so Joe, Joe, you know, um, give me a shot to mix it. <laughs> So okay, so you so got the budget for, to to make to to do it. I hired Josh Milan to play keyboards for me. Josh was like very young, okay, and we I remember we did the record off key. Not that I knew back then what off key was, because I didn't have a musicians here. The group and Arthur Baker, everybody, they all they were like it's off key, it's off key, but it was banging, and I was like. Uh, um, what do you mean it's off key? Now I know. I know. What do you mean it's off key? It sounds fine to me. No, it's okay. Blah, blah, blah. But because the shit hit the fan, you mean you mean they, they, they had to eat it up? That was that was my. Hang on. How did my, that happen? Did that record blow up? Who and why did that happen? Because I remember often them were not happy with the mix. They didn't like the way it sounded. I thought it was fierce. But I remember, no, every, no, no, everybody. I mean, even when 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 Lyle Levan came, he was like, "Yo, great work." I was like, oh, "That's what I remember." Shit. Everybody playing it. Lyle Levan said, "Oh my God, they, you know what I mean?" But 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 but, but, but his was funny, right? That let's say going back to eighty seven, eighty eight, and even eighty nine, my peers knew my work, right? When I first went to England in nineteen eighty nine for the DMC thing, and I go to a record store, it's like. Yo, I ruled the wall. You know what I mean? Between me and Frankie, it's like Death Mix had a wall. You go to Black Market, it was like, wow. It's like, I, and it wasn't just the DJs that gave me credit, the clubbers gave me credit. See, the clubbers, it's not like today, what's happening in New York and America with the clubbers, but really, clubbers all around, you know, you know, you know um, give you props. But it was really, I have to say, the UK, in the UK slash Italy, that when I went out there, I was a star. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, I can't get arrested at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, wow. Oh, my God. And forget it. And even playing those early days in the UK, I remember in, in, in 1989, and check this out. So, so a bunch of us were there, Bobby Shaw, Leslie, you know, the crew was out there for the DMC. Mickey Holloway and Pete Tong were playing at Cindy Astoria in London. This is where, where, when, when, when Make My Body Rock by Jamanda was out. And okay, I took my records, yo, I figured when I play, I'm gonna play. I played 55 minutes. Pete Tong says, yo mate, that was great because they were gonna put on, because they were gonna put Jamanda on. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, yeah, made great. And I was like, yo, I, it's like, I was only warming up. I didn't pay, I, it's like, I didn't pay none of my cuts. You know what I'm saying? I thought, blah, 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 blah. It was like, yo, everybody, everybody from America was like, what happened? I was like, I don't know. And I was like, listen, I don't care about the money. And they were like, no, no, that's how we do things here. You were great. And I was like. What do you mean I was great? You go, what do you like, mean what I was great? I, I, played, right? I played 55 minutes. It's like, I mean, what are we talking about? Six records? <laughs> 